We're turning to Exodus chapter 12 uh, as we turn to God's holy and precious truth. Exodus chapter 12, and I'm going to read with you from verse 29 as we come to the scriptures uh, this afternoon. And uh, I want to read from verse 29 and, and, and read, really read up to verse 42. It's uh, more of a, a longer passage than we normally do when we come to these studies, but that's because we're trying to, to take in all of the chapter uh, with God's help today. Our message I've called A Night to Remember, and I really based it, as you will see, on the words of verse 42. So Exodus chapter 12, and reading from verse 29. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne, unto the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And Pharaoh rose up in the night. He and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among my people, both ye and the children of Israel, and go serve the Lord as ye have said. Also take your flocks and your herds, as ye have said, and be gone, and bless me also. And the Egyptians were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We be all dead men. And the people took their dough before it was leavened, their kneading troughs being bound up in their clothes upon their shoulders. And the children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. And the children of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Succoth, about 600,000 on foot that were men beside children. And the mixed multitude went up also with them, and flocks and herds, even very much cattle. And they baked unleavened cakes of the dough which they brought forth out of Egypt, for it was not leavened, because they were thrust out of Egypt and could not tarry, neither had they prepared for themselves any victual. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing them out from the land of Egypt. This is that night of the Lord to be observed of all the children of Israel in their generations. Amen. We're finishing there at verse uh, 42, and we know that God will bless his precious word uh, to all of our hearts. Do join with me now, uh, beloved, in prayer as we come to the word of God. May he give us help as we turn to the scriptures. Let's pray. Uh, Father, for these moments that we have before us, we are in certainly seeking thy face once again. We know that there is um, a, a great landscape of truth that is before our eyes. And we're asking thee to journey with us and to show us the way. Uh, Lord, we're asking thee to speak to our hearts. We're praying that God will be merciful in our day. Give us a word for myself and through, Lord, all of the needs which are represented, we pray that thou would be pleased to take the word of God and may it find a resting place in all of our hearts. Oh, Father, we look to thee. We look to thee, our great God, and I pray now, fill me with thy spirit. Oh, Lord, drive away every obstacle, every barrier. Lord, we pray for these defeats, Satan. And Lord, have the victory and be glorified this day in the salvation of a soul and in the edifying of the dear saint of God. Hear our cry, we pray in the Savior's name. Amen. Beloved, in a, in a chapter which is not only big number-wise when it comes to verses, but big when it comes to details and events, it's always good for us to find a hinge or a pivot, we might say, in which we turn all of our thoughts and our considerations. I'm suggesting today that we look to verse 42 in order for us to find that very pivot or that hinge of which I've spoken of. 
where Moses records these words, it is a night to be much observed unto the Lord for bringing him out of the land of Egypt. He stands back and we see here as all is being surveyed, there is this testimony of an evening like this, a night that was really like no other. We also in our studies want to get back to Moses. I've been acutely aware that as we've taken time and it seems sort of longer than I I wanted to look at the ten plagues, uh, that we maybe have slightly gone off the beaten track when it comes to the specific life of Moses himself. But I I trust you've seen the reasons why. We've looked at those plagues and they've been helpful to, to some extent. However, we need to get back to Moses, the man of God. And what we discover as we look at this chapter is that what was for Israel certainly an evening and a night that was never going to be forgotten within their history was also for Moses as an individual a remarkable occasion as well, which he witnessed. And it's really from that perspective that I want us to see the happenings of all which unfolds in this chapter And before we do that, and before we try to climb up this viewing point and survey the entirety of this chapter, there have been those who come to this portion and they question something again of the chronology and the timing of the events and all the things which have unfolded. So again, I think it might be helpful that we just spend a little bit of time working our way through these thoughts. For example, some will come to these portions and they will say, well, when exactly did Israel leave Egypt. When was the exodus? What time of day? Was it day? Was it night? On what day? Was it the 14th day? Was it the 15th day of the month? And the reason for some people's uncertainty in these things is because they go to the likes of Numbers 33 and verse 3, and you read these words in Numbers 33. They departed, that is Israel, from Ramesses in the first month on the 15th day of the month, on the morrow after the Passover, and so on. So you read Numbers, Christian, and it tells us it was the 15th day of the month. But you read Exodus chapter 12, and all the focus seems to be on the 14th day of the month. And so some will come and they will say, well, what have you got a contradiction here? Is there an error? Is there a difficulty here that you can't overcome? Well, it's not as difficult as we might fear. Uh, and what it requires, and I think most of us know this, is really an understanding of the Hebrew day and what was unfolding before their eyes. For example, we know even from the beginning of Genesis that the, the day for the Hebrew was not morning and evening, it was evening and morning. The evening and the morning, the record says, was the first day. And so when we look at the history of the Jewish people and the Hebrews, we understand this very clearly, that the beginning of their day was the evening. And you'll see that in Genesis, and you'll see that recorded throughout the Scriptures. In other words, sunset signaled the end of the previous day, and with the very coming of the evening was the beginnings and approach of a new day to the Jewish and the Hebrew mind. And then you have to factor something else into the picture. When you read uh, chapter 12 and verse 2, you you will then remember that this was a a new beginning in many ways for the Jewish people. In chapter 12 and verse 2, it reminds us from this point on, at least in the religious calendar, that this was now the beginning of the year. What, What for us is our march. For them it was their aviv, or it would become Nisan. This was now the beginning of the religious year for the Hebrews. Now in terms of what was happening here in Egypt, the Passover and Exodus, it was the 14th day of this now new first month in which everything had kicked off. The Passover was being prepared as we read of in these chapters. And the preparation of the Passover was was on the 14th day and it was during the beginning of the day, which would be, as we now know, in the evening time itself, not in the sort of like 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock in the morning time. And so here were the the Jewish people, the Hebrew people. It was their 14th day. It was the beginning of the day, but it was the evening hour as such. And there they were making all their preparations. The Passover lamb was slain. The blood had to be applied. And in the midnight of that very self-same day, which, of course, remember now is evening as it comes to midnight, the, the firstborn in Egypt were put to death. And the plague itself was unfolding. 
And that's what we find in verse 31. Pharaoh calls for Moses, look at this, by night. And if you just try to now picture this in your mind, what was the 14th day? As the day began, that is in the evening time, after sunset, preparation of Passover, midnight then strikes, the firstborn are put to death at the command and the judgment of God. Pharaoh is filled with fear and consternation. He calls in that selfsame time, or in the latter times after midnight, Moses and Aaron to appear before him, and now he issues his decree, and he tells them that they all must go. Every man, every woman, every child, every animal, everyone must go. And on the first sign of light during still that same day, but as it now moved into the 15th day of the month, Israel began their epic move, reaching the borders of Egypt, that is Ramesses, on the 15th day itself. That's where you tie Numbers 33. That's how you bring the two things together. And so we don't need to fear these sort of things. We don't have to be afraid. You just need to understand what the scripture is teaching us. So with that chronology of events really in our minds, and we can sort of get a picture now, our focus now turns to Moses. And this is where we get our application for our message today. We turn to the man of God, and we are looking at a number of features in this night that was to be remembered. Beloved, the first thing I want to see is this. Moses, in this night, spoke of a necessity in the evening. And for this, we're looking at verses 21 to verse 28. Now, last Sunday, as we looked around the table, we we spent some time considering the Passover. And, And it's clear that in addition to everything else surrounding the Passover and the Paschal Lamb, that in order for the Passover to be effective in a sense, and for Israel to be passed over, what must happen? My friend, what must happen? The blood must be applied. And that's the the very first thing that really grips our thoughts and our concerns this day, is that when we look at Moses here, and we look at this man as he surveys all which is happening, he speaks of necessity in the night. And what has Moses received? Well, in the early stages, he's received the word from God. God has called Moses to himself. God has given clear instructions to Moses about the Passover lamb. God has said to Moses, Moses, you've got to take the lamb and given all the details of what the lamb must be like and why the lamb must be slain. And what do we find in verse 21? Moses He calls all the elders of Israel together and he communicates every single word of God to these people. But what strikes me as fascinating is that when you move into verse 22, that the very thing that Moses presses as a necessity upon the people is that they must be covered. They must have their homes. And, And as we know, the application is they must have their hearts. Covered by the blood of this lamb, if they are to not be touched by God's righteous judgment. And that's why I say that in this this hour, in this evening of all evenings, we see the man of God, Moses, once more coming to the fore. And he's received the word of God, and he's pressing home what is this necessity. They must have the blood upon the lintel, upon the two side posts, And we know, of course, that this is an application as we shall see to our hearts and our very lives. And and even as part of this great message, Moses says to the fathers and the mothers, this is something for your children, it's for future generations, verse 26. So when the children say, oh, 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 mom and dad, what does this mean? What do do these things mean? You know, when we had our Lord's table last Sunday, but it's a a point worth making that we come to the Lord's table and our our children, maybe if they sit beside us and they see what we're doing or they ask questions, that they they have every right to say, what does this mean? And the question is, what would you say in response? That the things that we do as Christians, the baptism, our our Lord's table, our our worship, the hymns that we sing, the reading of the word, and and our boys and our girls, they'll, they'll say, what do these things mean? Do we understand what these things mean? 
Now Moses is setting before him the great truth, and, and he's, he's saying here that when our children and our generations to come will see the, the fact that we remember this Passover year after year, years down the line, and they ask the question, what does it mean that we can point them to mercy and God's pardon and forgiveness, that God rescued us? So that's lost a little bit within our hearts, isn't it, in these days? So all of this means that we have in this chapter 12... And what what Moses will see unfolding is is of immense importance. It really is. Because all of these things are pointing us to Christ, as we know. To the Lord's table, to to all the things that we love and we cherish so much. As we look more closely at this necessity, notice there was necessity through adoration. You say, well, where, where is this? Well, if you look at the opening 12 verses... I want you to try and appreciate what was going through the minds of Moses, Aaron, the the elders, the rulers, the Israelites. What was going through their minds? 430 years of of slavery and cries and tears, witnessing the the, the, the judgments of God unfolding before their very eyes, seeing some of the most remarkable things that people have ever seen. But but now they're going to hear this message. We're we're, we're about to be delivered. we're going to rescue, get rescued. We're going to be uh, taken out of this land. It, it, the time has come. Any of you that have ever planned a, a time away, you know, a, a break, a holiday, you know, in those last few moments, you're consumed, aren't you? What are you going to pack? What, what, things, what things do you need to go? Have I got everything sorted? Have I got all the arrangements done? Have I, have I got these things all uh, sorted? Uh, am I ready to go? And we spend so much time consumed with details, things, and arrangements that there's nothing else we're thinking about. Well, what I love about this portion of Scripture is that when you look at the likes of verse 11, that Moses understands that there is, there is a, an immense situation before these people. There is so much to think about. And yes, they are to think about certain material things. Look at verse 11. They're to eat it with their loins girded. We'll look at this in a while as to what it means. Their, their shoes on their feet. But if you notice what Moses is saying here, it's before you take one step, and you leave, make sure you've worshipped. Make sure that you've worshipped. Make, make sure that you've, you've eaten the Passover. They must be ready to go, but there must be spiritual preparation before anything else. And that's the thing that we lack, isn't it? Even within the Christian church, we specialize at being prepared in everything that we need to be prepared with. But we are not prepared in heart. We haven't given ourselves to God's worship first. And this is of the utmost importance. My my dear Christian friend, nothing is as important as our worship of God. We must never allow even the busyness and the strains and the hardships of life or anything that we anticipate as something which is going to happen to keep us back from the necessity of adoration and the worship of God. Maybe that's what was in my mind when I forgot the announcement on Wednesday. Just uh, the message you get into a bit of a zone when you're trying to think of what you want to preach on. That, you know, sometimes other things, they're just uh, they're a blur. And, and in a sense, may that be something true of us, that there's, there's this focus on the necessity of adoring our God, just as Moses was like and these Israelites. You're going to go, you're going to be delivered, but make sure you worship him. Make sure you, you, you know you're right with God. Make sure you're covered. Make sure you're cleansed. And and of course, that leads us to the next area of necessity, which is through application. You see, nothing of which God instructed Moses would be of any use unless he first brought the people uh, the message and they brought the message to their hearts. Isn't that tremendous truth as relevant for today as it is in any age? Moses receives the word of God. Moses knows what he has to communicate to the people. They need to pass over lamb. They need to be covered. And the people hear the message. But my dear friend, it makes absolutely no use. There is no value, of no consequence, if to the heart the blood isn't applied. The homes must be covered. There must be application, or else even the eating of the lamb would be in vain. I, I thought about this, and I... It came to me as I was preparing this message. 
You know, we, we use these expressions, and I'm mindful of the little ones we're here and listening to the, the message this day, and um, we, we use expressions like this, you know, the Lamb of God, and being under the blood, and being covered by the blood, and applying the blood to the heart, and these are all expressions and phrases that we cherish, and we love, and, and we would say quite freely as Christians, but I always remember someone saying to me, who wasn't a Christian, that if you stand in the open air, and someone challenged me on this, and says, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world, and the majority of people have no idea what the Lamb of God means, what are you saying? There's truth in that. You know, for the, for, the, for the Israelites, they understood what the Lamb of God was, didn't they? They understood the Paschal Lamb because everything was there before their very eyes. So, so we stand here this day in this pulpit and we say, well, what does it mean that you say, well, are you under the blood or is the blood applied to your heart? Well, it, it means this. It means this, that just as the, the life of the physical animal was the blood and the life of the physical human is in the blood, as the scripture says. So when we think of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God's lamb, the fulfillment of all of these things, Salvation is the very merit and the worth and the efficacy of all that Christ is applied to our hearts, received by faith. If I say, are you under the blood? It is, in essence, we're saying, are you in Christ? Do you know him? My friend, these are things that we must not only know and believe, but be able to explain and communicate to others. And so on that basis, the necessity is application. To be, to be in that place of safety. The lentils above the doors, the posts themselves, representing the very framework and the fabric of our life and who we are and our hearts. Moses is saying there needs to be application here. And that's what you've got really in the opening portion of chapter 12. The evening to be remembered, the night to be remembered, is because Moses spoke of a necessity to adore God and worship him, but to have application to know Christ. And these are the first principles, my friend, before we go any further this morning. But then notice something else, and it's night to be remembered, that Moses witnessed urgency. He witnessed urgency through the night. Again, we, we look at Moses as, a, as one that sees all the things happening, and he sees urgency. He really does. Urgency is a feature which dominates much of this great chapter. And surely it is the case that when we think about the most critical aspects of our life, that a sense of urgency must always be about us. When you are in crisis, dear Christian friend, do you not respond, respond urgently in some manner? When there is some tremendous dilemma which is upon you, isn't there a, a type or a form of fervency that comes over your life? There is, isn't there? And I look at the, the events which are unfolding here, and there is an urgency which must be stressed and must be understood. And, and remember that urgency pervades the entirety of God's word. You look at the, the words of Hebrews 2 verse 3, and you will sense the urgency. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? I firmly believe that no words like those could ever be spoken or ever be communicated without urgency. I mean, the very meaning of them. How shall you escape? The idea of a need to escape suggests one of imminent danger and trouble and loss that's going to be sustained. You need to escape. No one escapes half-heartedly. No one escapes casually. When there is a need to escape and, and be taken away and move, my, there's something that grips the heart, isn't there? Something that stirs us along. Through the Old Testament scriptures, you've got the prophets, you've got men of God, and they came to the Israelites, whether in the north or in the south, or when they were united, and the, and the prophets were always urgent in their communication. They would bring the thus saith the Lord with a fervent, bold heart, not casually. Now, when we look at the state of the church, and I look at my heart, and we probably look at all of our hearts, we have to say that surely the one thing that we lack, that we maybe used to know a lot more, is, is urgency. We have to qualify what we mean here, by the way. This does not mean acting in the flesh. That happens a lot, and it's mistaken for urgency. It's not relying on human efforts. It's very possible, 
and we all will have to concede this, it's very possible to be very busy as Christians, but not be close to him. That's a terrible place to be in. Very busy about being Christians and doing things of a practical nature, but far away from him. So I refer to an urgency in which we understand our great need and therefore bring ourselves fervently to God and prepare ourselves faithfully before God that we might see the salvation of God. You say, well, where is urgency in chapter 12? Well, notice, first of all, there was urgency in Israel's haste. Verse 11, again, we'll look at other verses. Verse 11, ye shall eat it in haste. For the only time that people are told to eat quickly, unless, of course, you're trying to get out, get somewhere. Eat it in haste. It's the Lord's Passover. Now, the, the haste, or the speed, or the urgency and the fervency in which they're to eat the Passover, well, well it's obvious, isn't it? Because th- there's no time for leisurely eating here. I'm not trying to be comical on the thing, but it's not the case that the Israelites could sort of sit around the, the, whatever their tables or there on the floor or whatever means they had and sort of talk about the time of day. Pharaoh's a bit of a bad guy, isn't he? You know, all these sort of things, and the hours go by, and they're sort of slowly enjoying their meal and admiring the things. There's, 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 there's something about this whole occasion where everything has to be done urgently. And you say, well, well why? Why the need for urgency? Why the need to eat in haste? Because the Egyptian firstborn are about to die. Midnight's coming. And you've got to get out. You've got to get out. Soon would come the scenes of horror, and there would be an urging upon them to leave, as we shall see. And Moses is saying here, there's going to be urgency. There's going to be urgency in your eating, and then there's going to be urgency in your actions. You could like the verse 11 again of chapter 12, eat it with haste, and then you've got these words, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand. Again, for the little ones who are here, we don't hear these phrases, we don't talk about girding or loins when you go to school. <laughs> you need to go to school, guys, make sure you gird your loins. We don't speak in that sort of way, do we? So what does it mean? We don't have to worry too much unless you're going to school uh, children in a robe. Uh, maybe some of you are on some occasions. But the idea here is that they had these long flowing robes and of course they've got to tie them up. That there's, there's a need to run, there's a need to get going. You could have shoes in your feet. This, this normally wouldn't have been the case as they were eating because the, the shoes or the, whatever became the shoes were off so that the feet could be washed. But make sure you're eating with your loins girded. Make sure you're ready to go. Make sure your shoes are on. Make sure you've got the staff in your hand. Make sure you've got your support and your protection because you've got to go and you've got to be ready. There's urgency. All of this is indicative of vigilance and preparation and being circumspect. These are all Christian necessary truths. You go into New Testament scripture and, and friend, it is precisely the same. God urges us to a sense of Christian urgency. We're to put on the Christian armor. Ah, but why do I have to put on the Christian armor? Because you're under attack. Really? Yes, every day. And why do I have to be urgent? Because your life is passing by. And why do I have to be urgent? Because souls are perishing. Every reason to be urgent. The night cometh when no man can work. A people redeemed and rescued will always have a sense of urgency. That we are laboring for another day. And before they would even get to the banks and the shore of the Red Sea, there was an urgency in which they had to leave and get out. So there was urgency in Israel's haste, but there was urgency in the Egyptians' hearts as well. And and we look now at the the other side of the coin, so to speak, and we look at the Egyptians, and you know, urgency dominates their thoughts. Look at verses 31 to 36. Again, we're just glancing over the chapter in our message today. It struck Pharaoh's heart first, when all the firstborn died, and everything was lost to this wretched man. 
And, and he realized that no compromise could be found. And so there in verse 31, we read the scriptures. He calls for Moses and Aaron by night. There is no more tomorrow. There is no more next day. It's in that very moment. As, as death struck his heart and struck his home and struck his life and struck his whole nation. This once powerful man who felt he was omnipotent was reduced to absolute weakness. And he calls for Moses and he calls for Aaron and, and, and he says, all of you go, just go, just get out. No more excuses. No more trying to keep just you know, one hoof from an animal, no, all go. And, and what we see here, although it's not said directly, is from a, a civil and a legal perspective, the Israelites were now free. Now, physically, they were still there, but in terms of a decree, they were free. And isn't that wonderful? God freed them from this land. And, and now they must go. And if you notice the communication of the Egyptians to the Israelites in verse 33, it says that the Egyptians were urgent upon the people. So there's urgency. And you say, well, why, why were they urgent for? Well, they'll tell you themselves. If they were here, they would say it. And, and they tell us. They say in verse 33 at the end, we be all dead men. Now, they weren't all going to die. But this is what the impression catastrophe and crisis and death has upon people. And we've seen it ourselves over the last number of years in one measure or another. And, and, and in this sense, we, we have the Egyptians and the firstborn are died and they're in, they're in, their next thought is this, we're, we're next, we're next. We're, we're going to die. We're all going to die. And they feel as if the only, only course of action they can have is to take these Israelites and just to get rid of them. Get out. The impression of death was very heavy upon their hearts. And I look at this and I ask myself the question, it, it took this. It took ten plagues. It took the entire decimation of the land. It took destruction from river to land to animal to human life for a people to realize that he is God. What will it take for us? What does it take to move us? Don't be like these Egyptians. What a reminder to any who are not saved this day. The urgency of today. Not to wait for tomorrow. And so Moses witnessed urgency through the night. And the last of all, Moses experienced the enormity of the night. Verse 37 to 42. I, I, as I was bringing my thoughts to a close in the study of this, I was really trying to think of you and how, how, do, we, how do we get an understanding of what is before us here? How do, you, how do you gauge the enormity of what was, trying, what was happening and going to happen here? Now, again, like I often do, all I can keep thinking about is my own family. You know, you've been leaving a home with, with a number of people. It's, it's hard, isn't it? I thought it was hard leaving on my own. You, you leave with kids, you leave with people. Have you got your shoes? Yes. Have you got your shoes? Yes. Have you got your shoes? No. You know, something along those lines, just, just trying to get out. Or organizing people. Or trying to get, you know, group events. So here's a question. I was saying this to Naomi last night. She was quite close to the, the number, actually, so I didn't have any, any sort of sweeps to, to give as a reward. Um, maybe I'll get some in, in the future. But here's a question for you. How many left? Egypt. Think about that as I, as I go through my thoughts here. For over 430 years, Israel had li li lived in Egypt, okay? Now think about that for 430 years. Please don't es underestimate the sense in which leaving this land was an experience that they had never felt before. Now, they were slaves. We all know that. And they cried because of their bondage. We know this. And they longed for better days. But please remember this. They were humans. They had human nature. Many of them, you know, would not have been believers in a sense. Maybe outwardly following. We know from their time in the wilderness, there were attachments to Egypt that they were very hard to shake and get rid of. 
And so even though they were slaves in a land of 430 years, it still means they would have been accustomed to certain ways of life. So moving, which is a wrench for any person in any situation, can you imagine what it felt like? I want you to see that this day. And certainly for younger generations, for all of them had known nothing else. Nearly half a millennia had passed in Egypt, and from Jacob to Joseph, his brothers and their families, 70 entered the land of Egypt. It is estimated 2.5 million left. That's an incredible number. We read actually here in verse 37 that the men were 600,000 on foot. So the, when you compute this, you add, of course, the wives, uh, you add uh, the children, the servants, whatever it is, and you've got a, a great number there in the region of two and a half million. A whole nation leaving another nation. You add the women and children, of course, and you've got this number. And then you've got in verse 38, this little detail, a mixed multitude went up with them. What does that mean, a mixed multitude? Well, it means there were other Semitic people there and races. There were also many Egyptians who went with them. Some through intermarriage, others through conviction. Some had come to believe on Jehovah, the Lord God Almighty. You know that from numbers because their presence is recorded for us. And there's, there's still mercy. Not every Egyptian perishes. A number are saved. And this vast number now assembles themselves together in the first ray of light and they move themselves as one people. And now they leave. All with their flocks, their herds, and the Bible says they're very much cattle. It is here we're told to look at this spectacle as Moses did and to say this is a night to be much observed. Here's a question with which I finish. What power did this? What power did this and can only do this? Who can take 70 and over 430 years of slavery and bondage, deliver two and a half million slaves? Who can humble the world's most powerful ruler? I know in our thoughts and our considerations this day, all the things which have happened over the week, lots of questions being raised. What about our land? What about our nation? What about our churches? Have we learned anything from Pharaoh and Moses? Look at what God does. He who makes the difference between person and person. It is Jehovah God who can take these people and deliver them. The same God who took your life, my dear Christian friend, and saved you. And it's the same God who reigns today. I remember there's a greater exodus taking place. God is still building his church and God is bringing them out through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ into his marvelous light. He is constantly bringing his people out to a better day. Oh, my friend, with that upon our hearts, let there be necessity. Let there be urgency in our hearts, especially as we come to our mission. And let's always recognize the enormity of a God who is almighty. Him we serve and his we are. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen. Amen.